your book, The Cedars, is absolutely beyond comprehension. We've already done, I would say probably about six to eight hours on my channel already. And we were only at like page 258 because there's just so much here. Some people will never buy it because they, you know, maybe can't afford it or they just, it's just too overwhelming. And of course, Elena understands that because that's who she is as a person. Um, and so we've been going through and reading. Uh, we're going to go through some elements. And again, always remembering that there are people that are coming in newly to the information, guys. And don't be impatient. Just be understanding. Other people deserve to hear, um, you know, the beautiful things that we're going to discuss. Uh, now, we are going to talk about some of the Galactic Councils. And again, these are beings that have been seeded in our galaxy who have seen planets like ours that have been trying to be re-terraformed by our souls blocking out the sun, trying to enslave the population, bringing in greys and reptilians that have now gone. So a lot of the galactic councils have already seen this. Nothing new on Earth, just that us here that we're not putting up with it. Um, so I know that the Council of Five is called something else. I want to show the uh, logo of the Council of Five. And we're going to go into more of this in the development that Elena is going to um, pick up. I'm just going to say a few words and then Elena is going to deliver. Um, so we're going to talk about the Galactic Federation of Worlds not having any fixed headquarters, but having different locations where they meet using the holographic technology. Um, tell us about the time that you witnessed a meeting on a battleship with Thorhan and you were then and that was also when you actually, oh, that's interesting. I had forgotten that part where you said goodbye to Valnek, the gay um, Pleiadian that had to leave um, his role on board uh, the battleship because of a, a girl down here that was making up stories and lying about him. So she was married and she has three kids. And so he had to be removed because we can't have any liars in these councils or these militaries that are here to support us. Um, so tell us about that incident with Thorham um, and Ardana was there as well. And then you just saw this beautiful, this kind of the quantum holographic technology. And then the time where you met uh, Val Thor again, the man that we know was in the Pentagon in America that's been proven, photographs of him and everything. And tell us about the chairs, the holographic chairs and <clears throat> all of that, please. Off he came, my love. <laughs> well, that's a lot. Um, so yes, in October, no, excuse me, in November 2021, uh, I went to the, the Excelsior, which is one of the battle stations of the Federation where Thorhan works and when, where I get my information. Um, and at the time, yes, I was there that day to bid farewell to a child friend of childhood friend of mine. I was devastated. Um, Valnek or Valorian Nek or Oroyan is his name, um, Valnek for short. Uh, Valnek was part of my rescue team when I was nine years old. So um, he's an old friend, you know, and uh, well, I speak about it in my 2020 books, A Gift from the Stars for the first time. Anyways, um, and uh, so, yeah, because lies, someone pretending uh, getting information from him, which were lies uh, on Earth, um, he, for his honor and, and, and safety, he had to, not really safety physically, but, you know, his, um, how to say, yes, uh, to protect him, he had to leave the soul system and he was reassigned now we know where in the Altair star system as colony governor but at the time yes he had to go because he had been in contact with this person this girl what because he rescued her when she was a child so to erase all doubt of him communicating with her which he wasn't anymore they asked him to go Ardana actually negotiated this to protect him so he was never going to come back and he will not come back until this person is uh, making up all these stories to make things simple. So I was very upset to bid him farewell and give a last hug physically and uh, I, I was crying, I wasn't well at all. And on the way back, I was with Thorhan and Ardana. Uh, Thorhan was uh, not in good mood either. Um, Ardana said, 
wanted to, you know, comfort me and change my mood. And she's, we, we walked past her um, meeting room. So she said, oh, I'm going to show you something. Come in. And that's how I was for the first time in a, in a meeting room, an official meeting room, holographic meeting room. Normally, I meet people physically in offices. Normally, it happens in Ardana's office when I get my information. But then um, there was a holographic meeting room. There was a, so a table with segments. Imagine like a pie with a, like triangles segments and in the middle there was a colon and this colon was the 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 holographic engine you can say device that was connecting uh the participants mm -hmm. to this place broadcasting their holograms why is it happening like this well in all the councils i would say the important councils in this galaxy they prefer not to have physical meetings because it's dangerous for the people. Imagine you have different planetary uh, representatives who meet in one place physically, an enemy can come and blow up this place, you know. So that's why for safety, people stay in either in their own location or go into secret locations of the Federation, uh, but one always separate from the other and they uh, if they don't have the technology at home to holographically project and then they project to this meeting point that can be on board often spaceships and they interact with each other via their holographic projections and they can be in any part of the galaxy you know, it's quantum projections, so the distance doesn't interfere with the quality of the, the projection. So I saw that and I had to leave before the meeting because it wasn't something that uh, I was uh, scheduled on, but I saw how it functioned. Um, and then uh, I, I happened to attend meeting of the, the councils of the federation there are two councils in the federation there are local councils and then there is the lower council which has a representative of each culture it is huge uh, and imagine uh, star wars with this big council um cylind cylinder with everyone on a little balcony and you have uh you know uh I think it's a new Star Wars, Queen Padme and Palpatine on their like um, hovering platforms. Well, it's a bit like this, the lower councils. But the higher council, I went uh, very few times. Uh, it's um, 24 representatives of sections of the galaxy. And you have um, a herald that changes all the time. The herald at the time was a tangry, tangry at the time, the first time I went there. And the first time I went there, uh, it was when the Prime Directive was changed, uh, amended to uh, counteract the Grey infiltration agenda. So they wanted to uh, give me notice of this. And I was introduced to the Higher Council because um, I wasn't entitled to at attend because I wasn't part of the Lower Council. It goes from down to up. Because why I wasn't member of the lower council? Because Earth is not yet member of the Galactic Federation of Worlds. Right. So Earth is not represented in the lower council. So I had to be introduced by someone, member of the lower council, who was at that time Ambassador Val Thor. And it was a great honor to meet him again. So uh, he met me in, in an antechamber on a ship. And uh, I he brought me to this 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 meeting and he stayed in the background because he was um you know my uh, accompanying me my escort my introducing person <laughs> so um that's my experience just amazing now you actually this is you and Valthor you actually got to speak at that meeting yes 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 so like, what did you deliver and how did it feel? And what did the other beings and people 
look like and what were they sitting on what how were they holographically projected and were they all physically there or not there none of them was physically there except myself and Val Thor who were on the ship I haven't I was never given the location of that ship could have been anywhere in the galaxy uh Thorhan had had uh, first I went on one of Thorhan's scout ships and then uh he projected me there but not projected, sorry, teleported me there on that ship, and I had no idea what this ship was anyway. Uh, first, I was impressed not in a way of being scared or whatever. I was impressed by the beauty of this meeting. You know, these, uh, the, the, there were geometrical patterns on the ground, and there were transparent walls where you could see the stars. Space was amazing. And there was a central module that was projecting on the ground lines of light throughout the geometrical patterns. And there were 24 um, like I would say, spots on the ground that were lighting up when the hologram of the person was connecting. And it was projected from the ground, you know. So the, the, the projections were bigger than normal. They were huge. That was beautiful. And they were transparent and glittery. The most beautiful of them was, was the, the Osman uh, representative, was a lady. She was beautiful. And she was she is the, the caretaker of the prime directive. That's her role. Um, so um, it was uh, beautiful. She, beautiful. Um, that's what I can say. <laughs> She is the Osman lady. Yes. And there is the elder Tengri Tengri. Um, the Herald, is, yes. Yeah. And you said, which is so great, which is where so many countries on this planet have totally stuffed up having dictators in for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Oh, my God. Um, and so they move them around. And tell us again, how often do the heads of the Council of Nine... Um, or the nine rather, well, yeah, the heads of the council of nine um, or five, we're going to get to that in a second because there's been some confusion. Um, <clears throat> how often do they have to step down from the role so they don't become a dictator? So that's the counts, the high council of the Galactic Federation of Worlds. Um, you, it, it can be confusing. So I'm talking about the Galactic Federation of Worlds, the high council, they are 24, okay? The cedars are also 24 different cultures. It's something totally different. It's the Intergalactic Confederation. We find the number, the numbers 7, 12, 7, 9, 12, 24 in the councils because these are um, cosmic geometry numbers. And that's how it is, it is structures, structured. You have, so we're talking about the my experience in the High Council of the Galactic Federation of Worlds. The Council of Nine, which was nine before and then has been five, and then now it's called the Council of Al Nilam because there are seven going to on eight. Uh, that's something that is in Orion, that's in independent. Now you have the nine, who are nine plasmic supra consciousnesses living in the void between the universes, and they are not a council. Okay. Now let's go back to the the High Council of the Galactic Federation of Worlds. Um, what do you want to know already, please? <laughs> a question. Well, like, but just how it breaks down. Like, it's good to know that there isn't um, a like a person that's in charge all the time, forever mm. and ever and ever. Um, mm. Yes. So they change by cycle. Um, it's not like a year on Earth. It's cycles based on the 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 rotating time of the galaxy um there's the time is not linear but anything that has gravity has also a linear time so you all are always living on two time the linear time if you are in a gravitational situation and the time field that is not linear so the galaxy nataru has a linear time as well because it's a rotating object. You have gravity binding all the stars to the center. So this uh, this 
linear galactic time is compartmentalized in how to say divided in uh, cycles of time you know the earth for instance is uh, taking to um, 250 million years earth years to go around so that's linear time you know so every cycle small cycle i wouldn't be able to explain how long it corresponds on earth because it's different linear times uh, um no i <laughs> I know I try to be clear. I didn't say timeline. I said two different linear time, galactic linear time of rotation and earth linear time of rotation is okay. Different speeds, different linear times that we are clear about that. So they change, they change regularly among themselves, among the 24. That means one cycle, the herald will be this person. The, the next cycle, it will be another one of them, of the 24. Now, within the 24, now, each representative will also be replaced cyclically by a representative from their planetary civilization. So the, each of the 24 changes regularly, and also the roles within them, among them, changes regularly. It's always flowing, always moving. And that uh, doesn't allow ego or power games because these are rules and are very strict and everyone is happy with this. Mm. And the people vote. It's like, Earth, oh, look, we've got to pay attention. Okay, you're given the blueprint in the book, The Cedars, <laughs> you know, how to run successful councils that look after everybody. Okay, now we're going to talk on to a very well-known and beautiful beloved annex. Um, and he is somebody very connected to you. I've also physically met him. I'm, I'm so honored to say he's actually my first ever memory in this lifetime, pretty much of being picked or put back in my crib um, by him. So he's very real and beautiful and gentle. Um, so this gorgeous, lovely um, star father of yours um, is one of the members, uh, the Council of Zagara. So can you share with us a little bit about uh, this is beautiful. When you went to Alnalam, when you went, tell us about the experience. What does it look like? What does it feel like? But not just that, with Annex, he came to pick you up. So take us through. You're an island. You get the nod. Hey, we're coming to get you. What does it feel like in your body and what happens to your body? And then what was it like seeing this and what happened after that? That was an amazing experience. That was an amazing experience. And I can't wait to go back there if I am always going back there in this existence. Um, so he picked me up with a ship, teleportation from ground to his ship. And then we went, we left the solar system and we, the ship went into a portal stargate mode. The ship, ships can do that. Some ships can do that. And Ohorai ships can do that. They, uh, they can, they are spherical and they can themselves create a portal singularity and teleport them wherever they want. So the ship teleported to the surroundings of the star Alnilam in the Orion constellation where the seat of the Council of Alnilam is. What I felt is that um, I felt like a teleportation, but much more intense, of all my body tingling and buzzing. All the, not only all the particles of my body were uh, tingling like a normal teleportation, but also buzzing, vibrating. And I lost consciousness. I lost awareness. I came back to my senses I was still in the in the ship in the in the armchair with Anax and uh, I was there I have no idea how long the the travel took I don't know uh it's you know Stargate is instant teleportation so I I, I don't know I don't know and when I opened my eyes it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my in this life, in this existence. Mm. Um, Al-Nilam is a blue giant star. 
and around it it has a field of of gas gases blue gases and it's like a haze it's absolutely magnificent like imagine a blue star giant it has a crystalline aspect blue crystalline aspect and um around it you have like a blue nebula <laughs> it's beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful so uh, they call it zagara alilam zagara or zagara 1 and the, the the council is on the second planet but they call it zagara 3 so it's a bit confusing confusing the, the count from the stars okay from the star so we went to zagara the the planet zagara 3 and um it's in a higher density it's in the sixth density so you the the luminosity is really really brighter because as you go forward in density higher in faster densities the light is brighter okay we are seeing this on earth we are shifting into a higher density the sunlight is brighter and is white now not yellow anymore so you see all these things and so we arrived on zagara zagara 3 the planet luminosity was really uh, difficult and it's not the same breathable air um, when Anax comes to visit me, he has always his environmental brown suit with his black belt. And now it was my turn to have one. So I had my uh, human corresponding environmental suit, which is uh, blue and a yellow golden belt of um, uh, frequency belt. So I uh, that created um, a field around me containment field where I could breathe and I could um, sustain uh, how to say withstand the gravity on that planet the radiation from the stars who would have killed me if he didn't have that and uh, the atmosphere the pressure everything the magnetic field so I had a heavy heavy uh environmental field generated by the belt and the suit so uh, I had difficulty to see I was feeling very dizzy and it was very bright so all the drawings I I, I made from the, the the town the capital town on Zagara are very succinct and not not very good because I couldn't see really well so uh, the drawings are a bit childish but you know that's all I could get to you <laughs> my vision wasn't great uh, when we got into the council building, the which calls the, the the fortress of the meetings, um, I the, the it was dimmer, the lights were dimmer, so I could see better, and provide more uh, informational drawings. Um, not you have questions to ask me from from here. Um, no, you're covering so much and it's so great and uh, it's just so beautiful. I really wanted to share again the how you felt like going to Al Nalam and uh, again, again for people that may be new to the information is that when you look up and you see Orion's belt we're focusing on the middle star you've got one yes. two three in a row the middle star but then if you look at the middle star and you go all the way out 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 to the left 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 you're going to hit Betelgeuse or Battle Guys which has been the biggest issue the biggest pain the biggest horror of tried well, they tried to implement complete slavery on our planet from that standpoint. And what else is so interesting about Beetlejuice? They made a so they made a film, of course. They're always putting out, you know, truth somehow that the predator class um, is that we were told that the first time I ever saw Beetlejuice, I was with a girl, poor thing. She was such a drunk, God love her. She lived down the road in a caravan from where I was living, and she would just wander drinking her wine. And I would often go out and give her a hug and a, a sandwich or whatever. Anyway, she was the first one to show me. This is what this is. But she said, this is a star, a dying sun that should have gone out years ago. And nobody can explain why it's still in the sky. So she was giving a story, she was told, to make it a something of a creation or something of a wow, a, a wonder in the sky. You know, again, to draw attention to this majestic light that should have gone out but hadn't you know and that's again what they do isn't it 
Yes, well, the Betelgeuse was the 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 center, the home world, home star system. <clears throat> sorry, for the Eban. The Eban are the ones who are responsible for most of our miseries on Earth. They are the ones who signed the Griela Treaty with the Admi Eisenhower administration in 1955. The Eban are the creators of the Nebu and the Alliance of the Six. They are really uh, they have been the the most uh, important enemy Earth has ever had, beside others. Um, and they maintain their star uh, active by technology. Okay, when the Nebu collapsed last year, or two years ago actually, the 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 Council of Al Nilam took things in hand, and try to sort out what was going on with the, the, the star and how and so the star was very unstable very very unstable it was contained not to explode by technology like a Dyson sphere all around it you know so the the, the council of al nilam has been working very hard to stabilize this this star yes yes and it's it's stable now it is stable if it had exploded we would have um, heard about it. <laughs> wow. We would have heard about it. It can be such a stretch for people that know nothing of the reality of their world. You know, they, like I, at some point, like most of us, we come in with this amnesia um, and we don't realize that every single aspect of life without exception is controlled. What we see, think, drink, now they're poisoning skies and foods and, you know, um, shutting down chicken farms and trying to force this disgusting lab grown meat in the UK. Apparently that's where one of the first countries that are going to be given this slop, you know, because they're trying to remove our independence to, you know, raise beef or whatever. Um, and um, I've completely forgot what I was going to say now. Take me back a step. I don't know where you wanted to go. We were focusing on... Um, Oh yeah, the people that the stretch for them. That's right. I was gonna say it's such a stretch for people who are like they could be watching this going, oh my god, god, look at those silly women talking about aliens and UFOs and starships and this, that, and the other. But the the sadness is for them because they're so far behind. But it will be a quantum jump once they realize everybody that is still mocking and laughing and just criticizing and they're saying they're crazy. Once they realize that actually you've been everywhere you've said, you've done everything you've said, you've brought us so much information that NASA shits its pants around you. They're so worried about what you're gonna bring out next. Um, Aerospace Corporation, other corporations, I can't be bothered to put their names in my mouth and they're really not fit for, for notice, but it's just so incredible. And there'll be such a big catch up, but you're ready for that. You've always been ready for that. You're not going to be overwhelmed with this suddenly people wanting to celebrate who you are because you've always been strong, stand on your own two feet, tell people, this is what's going on. These are the names of the people I work with. They are not omnipresent angelic guardian angels. They're real physical humans, real people. Um, and although Annex is different, he's a different being and he looks like a beautiful well, we saw his picture, his big eyes and his beautiful face and his whole different rhythm and resonance and his gait, his gliding gait. And, uh, but Annex is possible for him to be in different places at once. Yes, he is able to project himself in what we call omnipresent. But someone like Thorhan, the physical human man, Thorhan, your partner, your, your husband, he isn't, is he? No, no, he's human, like me, you, is a human, so humans can be in one place at a time. Yeah, and then he and Captain Ardana, Commander Admiral Ardana, one time again, to remind people and new people coming. One time, I was in my room in Costa Rica, and Thorhan and Admiral Ardana holographically projected into my room, and the most surprising thing that my brain captured was how shockingly big they were. 
And in real life, they're that size. So they didn't, yes. they didn't project to me in a little holographic bubble with an image. It was like they were literally in the bubble, the holographic bubble, but the sizes they would be if I was standing next to them. And I found that remarkable and it really landed in me. Wow, I did not know or remember because we have these experiences going and go, oh my God, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. And it's like when we got that photograph of Valnek when he was leaving and we couldn't understand why he was so angry in his face, like really like, you know, and, and there's a huge bubble and you took it a picture through the glass, the glass in my house because the room was full of this plasma. We didn't know what it, because we were chatting and stuff had happened. You'd just come back from meeting the nine and you were completely undone. Your whole realm, even though you'd had all these experiences, just collapsed, fell apart. I couldn't pick you up for days. You were just gone but nobody couldn't have not been as affected as you by seeing what you saw. Um, and you've taken so many you know, bullets and arrows and disgusting abuse from awful people, mostly men, mostly little pithy, non nothing men that are looking for a, you know, fame and glory have, have been the ones to attack you. I found that quite surprising. Um, like 35 and up, I've guessed to like 55, maybe that's the age range. Um, but but yeah, you um, but and you and that's again where people decided that Elena Denan has changed. She's changed. I see it in her eyes. She's changed. Of course, she changed. You muppet, and so would you if you'd gone through that bloody trauma. Grow up, Jesus. Anyway, that was a couple of years ago. <laughs> but again, for people that still hear shit and lies about Elena Denan, oh my God. Yeah, don't, 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 you know, now we're on our own, discernment, discernment, discernment. So, so brilliant. So, um, yeah. Okay, listen, let's jump to Stargate. I want to show an image that's in your book here and some of the symbology, um, because, you know, we see these depictions of Stargates and there's often symbology, they, they are technology. Um, and I just want to say that this is, this is you, this is some of your words. There was something under the water that was drawing my whole being towards an invisible vortex. Something was dominant there, that it, something was dormant there, that had been extremely powerful in the past. It wasn't from this world, I could sense it. Standing at the edge of the pool, I closed my eyes. When I took a deep breath, I suddenly saw the starry heavens and the Milky Way, the Orion constellation, the Pleiades, the Big Dipper, and many others. I was projected in consciousness among the stars. From here, I could go anywhere I wanted. Here was a junction doorway to the stars. I want to take you a bit down memory lane as well, because years ago, you, me, Tony Rodriguez, and definitely Jean-Charles Moyen, we did a beautiful broadcast together, and it was the first time you'd actually gone through a stargate in space. And it had a physical mark on you. And in a, in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll go more into that. But I remember how beautiful. I love it when our brothers and our sisters, you know, our beautiful group of friends that have all had experiences that we share with the world. Um, Tony said, you, you let us know that the first time you went through it, it was so physical, you felt really violently sick. And then the ship parked for 10 minutes and then Tony has an aha awakening moment and he went oh my god he hit, he went yeah he goes I always wondered why every time we go through the gate the gate the portal the stargate in space it always docks for 10 minutes and he goes that's because there will be some new people that had to get used to that and not get sick and it was in a moment and I was like oh my god if that wasn't cross-referencing and cross-validation like, I don't know what is, but tell us what kind of ship were you in? Who were you with when you went to that part of the galaxy? And why were you going there? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I've been through different stargates now, so uh, I don't know which, uh, which you are referring to. I've been to Alilam. I've been to in Anak's ship, the ship teleported. I've been through the Jupiter Stargate to go to the Sirius B star system. Right. I've been on a Stargate on Neptune. I haven't really spoken about that really uh, for the moment. 
Uh, maybe you're referring when I went to uh, Series B, I suppose. I think that was it. Is yeah. that that moment? Yeah, because at that time you were doing a lot. You were doing an awful lot of visiting to Jupiter and Ganymede. And it was a massive part of your life at that time, right? Like 21, 22, I think. Yeah, not 22. Yeah, so I'm, I may have been taken uh, through the, the Jupiter uh, Stargate. I've been taken through it twice, actually. Uh, I don't enjoy Stargates at all. I don't like it. You know, first it's fun. So, oh my gosh, we're gonna go to Stargate! Wow! You arrive on the other side. You go, oh no, you're so sick. You say never ever again. You try a second time. You're a bit apprehensive, and it's. But then I've been told you're getting used to it, and your body is getting used to it with time. So I'm always given a lot of water to drink after that too, because water is vorticial uh, substance that helps your body to uh, ground again and to uh, settle all the particles so and you feel less dizzy it's it's a dizziness like a it's a you know um a transport sick motion sickness but multiplied by you don't know how <laughs> uh so when i went on in the series b star system it was to visit my, my old friend myra was also a part of the team who rescued me uh, when I was nine years old. Um, Myra moved the Series B star system back to her home world, Nayan, uh, in 2022, when the, the liberation of the undergrounds of Earth was completed. So she didn't have to work with the, the hybrid children at that time. It was done. So now she 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 has been working since this time at healing them and in the programs of reinsertion of these hybrids. And she's back on Nyan. She's uh, one of the the main officers, medical officers, science, medical science officers, sorry, in um the I think it's Ushuri district, if I pronounce it well on Nayan and uh, there's a big medical center there. Um, her daughter, ad adop adopted daughter Gaia is helping them, her. Um, so the ship, I think it was a uh, Thorhan's uh, ship, a flagship, fleet flagship, I think. Uh, oblong with two back wings uh, that comes a bit forward like this. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ship. I, I like his uh, the, the, his flagship. And um, that's where I went. I love it. I love it. There's just so much to you. And again, for those that don't know, you literally lived in Egypt for more than eight years. You were the senior hieroglyphic translator at the Temple of Karnak in Luxor in Egypt. And your body of work, your archaeological, you know, science mind, your degrees that you have, everything that you've done, it is so wonderful for an, an individual to look and map your life from beginning to this current moment and say, of course it's you. Of course it's you. It couldn't have been somebody who didn't have, you know, a real rich embroidery of, of experiences and knowledge to be able to back her own self up, you know. Uh, stand the you know the, the the stuff that comes at you when you start putting the truth of the reality of our world into the field i want to read a little bit about the abydos gate this is one of your experiences in egypt where this is now yes. an earth experience as a young woman when you're also you know starting to get those signature frequencies where we start to remember things we've been and done before which are you know in our cellular memory we said, <clears throat> April 99, Abydos, Upper Egypt. I was visiting for the first time the Temple of Sephi I as part of my archaeological training. Um, what struck me first as we entered the l large forecourt hammered by the blazing sun was the temple with rows of sturdy square pillars and, and a bare sci-fi style ramp accessing the main terrace. It seemed familiar from another lifetime, something Atlantean. Stepping on the ramp confirmed my awkward feeling this place was older than anything else I'd ever seen. A man was chanting psalms in Arabic. His voice was echoing beautifully in the high ceilings and the imposing columns. Sacred sound of timeless places. 
The chant of this man was slowing down. The minutes of the golden dust gently floated in the sun's rays. My team rushed towards the corridor staircase in the back, engraved with the famous dynasty's Abydos King's List. Um, and it was only minutes before I could hear them reading out loud the cartouches with excitement. It seized by the staggering energy of the place, I walked slowly like, like if through a thicker air. It was strange. There was something special here that changed the quality of the air, something palpable that could even slow down time. I was drawn to a series of chapels to my right that led to steps and smaller, beautifully decorated hall at the bottom, which was a false door carved in stone. I felt my legs like cotton. I knew from my training in Egyptology that these false doors were common in funerary spaces. There are also many strange old places on the planet. We can occasionally find these doors sculpted into the rock. In these places, local traditions whisper these doors open access towards other dimensions and that we lost the key somewhere in the meanders of time. If I was to live this experience now, I would know that these keys were frequency keys. I ran the palm of my hand on the door, but to sense that there was nothing behind it other than thick wall, stone wall. I had a strong feeling that the, that the real door was somewhere else, but not far. In fact, it was very close. I walked back to the main hall and met a colleague who asked me if I had seen the Osiri Osirian not yet, I replied, not yet. Here are some of the images, again, that you put. Um, some of the photographs you've, you've kept, you French people, you keep your diaries from childhood, you keep notes, pictures, photographs from childhood. It's part of your culture as well. I know this is your study, but I'm just saying, again, about your body of work and how you've kept things and been able to cross-reference from your time as a little girl to an archeologist, scientist, you know, and even now when things are opening up, you're like, oh my God, I found this. You published recently, you found an old t-shirt from your time. And it was a, a t-shirt of a bar that you used to go to in Egypt. I mean, beautiful. I mean, so tell us a little bit more about this and the hidden doors and how that can also relate to, you know, off planet. The, the Abydos Osirian is as old as the Sphinx of Giza. And you can see because it is buried at a lower level, you know, that's the deeper you you dig, the, 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 the farther you go back in time. The both structures, well, we found, we when the, uh, the Abydos Ozarayan was dug out, they had a part of the domed ceiling that has been removed when they, they dug it, because at the time, <laughs> You know, the early uh, 19, 1900s, they were the, excavating the dynamites. <laughs> but there's been uh, drawings uh, and uh, survey made. So we have the traces of this domed ceiling and it had the same water marks as the Sphinx. As at one time, it was flooded. And um, you see really the heavy rain damaging the structure. And we know that the Younger Dryas last great flood was 9,600 before Common Era. So uh, that's interesting. These were very old, 36,000 years old, BC, before Common Era, BCE, I would say. Uh, they, they were uh, built by star people and the the Abydos Osirion had um, a stargate, still has, and is still there, buried. This uh, stargate is a way of communicating with homeworld planets and uh, still active. Mm -hmm. In uh, the 1980s, I suppose, if maybe I'm wrong, uh, there was um, uh, a gray alien in Area 51 his name was J-Rod. He was there to give people a con consultation on technologies. And he was a bit kept at the end uh, against his will. And he asked one of the employees to uh, take him to Abydos, to the Osirion, because there was a stargate there that would bring him back home. So that was interesting. So this uh, 
this episode. Yeah, as I, I went there a few times, you do Zyrion, and you can really feel this this uh, static energy that is under the ground in one of the, the uh, inundated chambers. Stargates are often indicated by one sign. The flower of life, which is a structure of the universe. And the flower of life, the, the pattern of it, represents the bubble universes. But as I explained it in my uh, webinar about time, the lines are also pathways to travel between universe and through space. Shortcuts, the nodes are stargates. So you have also a map, mapped, uh universe so you see flower of life and in the in abydos on one of the walls of the osirian you have the flower of life painted many times flower of life is the secret of the the universe the structure of the universe and has so much knowledge and power to understand from it that's why allow me danny to just stick that in <laughs> No can do this with you. I can do this with you. Um, for in order for humans not to understand how powerful the flower of life tool is, a counterintelligence uh, developed uh, a narrative, a psychological operation that is called uh, Ashayana Dean, followed by Lisa, Lisa Rene, which is a total manipulation and fakery. Uh, saying that the flower of life is the daisy of death and something very uh, negative and they redirect people to another geometrical pattern which in itself has absolutely no power. It's bland. bland. And they wrap that in, in um, hermetic nonsense, a gibberish of different terms borrowed from different Kabbalistic uh, traditions and they make it make it a soup to make you swallow i don't understand so it must be real <laughs> so i want to stick that in the flower of life is the real deal yeah it's so important again and i i, I do believe that that most people with an open mind and an open heart can you know can feel can see can when you you know, when you think about it again, not as like a 2D, as a flat, a flatness, but as a, a beautiful ball, a beautiful, you know, th three, four, five D energy, a frequency. It's so exciting and it's so ancient. Um, and yeah, and yet people use, you know, fakery for that too. As you know, I had the honor of um, interviewing our friend David Adair, the great, the one and only rocket man. Um, uh, last week and I needed to address something directly with him because guys I've said to you before many times on my channel if you're going to call someone or something out for bullshittery because you know they're harming truth you know they're leading people astray for agenda or, or otherwise you know generally agenda for self manipulation confusion uh, you better be right you better have your ducks lined up because when you say someone's name and you put wrong information about them, not only does it come back on you, but it is so hurtful to that person. You know, it is so wrong to assassinate the soul of another, um, you know, unless they need a good beating, obviously. Um, so uh, David Adair, I, I heard it from him directly. I questioned him directly. And then when we went to record, because we spent hours on the phone before that, we went to record and I raised it again, uh, the fact that, he had an, an experience at Area 51 where he met, he had first contact with a beingness named Pithalum. And as he says himself, Pithalum chose David. Now, it's like Elena Danan. When you've talked about Thorhan, I'm married to Thorhan. No, I'm married to Thorhan, you know. Annix is talking to me. I listened to a meditation that you made, Elena, and his energy transferred to me. So Annix is talking to me now. Oh, my goodness. OK, you make it very clear. No, these are people on your team. They're with you. So get your own gig, guys. Get your own gang. <laughs> but, but be honest. Anyway, so with David Adair, 
and darling Pithalim energy that resides only with him. There are people that are, are flogging crystals. It's, I it just makes me want to cry, honestly. It's, it makes me so angry as well that they would dare to do that. Abuse the beautiful man, David Adair, who's given us more technology than most on our planet since Nikola Tesla. Fact that this energy, biologic, this beautiful consciousness, it chose him. He's been with her. He doesn't abuse her. And he said he was chosen. He said, she chose me. His words, she chose me. Um, but they're saying that they're uh, Pithalum's talking to them and she's jumping into crystals and she's healing and really pretty crystals with the flower of life over them. So of course they look proper gorge. Stick a light through it. Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. It's a bloody masterpiece to look at, isn't it? But it doesn't host the energy of Pithalum, and it's just bloody wrong to do that. Someone wrote to me when I put this out there with David, he's sitting next to me and we're saying, this is a lie. David said, it's a money grab. It's not true. They're his words. Somebody wrote, Danny, you clearly don't have any education. These aren't cheap Alibaba crystal balls. I'm like, mate, be quiet, delete, you know. It's not about education. It's about being a good human being and not lying and abusing somebody else's story. Someone's beautiful experience that is not yours. Anyway, that's yeah, a no, I'm, that later. I'm a victim of that a lot, but, you know, do I care? No. I know. I well, you, get to to point, you get to a point, as you've had to, where so much of it's gone on that you just have to go, right, well, you know, whatever. Now, you mentioned, I didn't know that J-Rod had, did he get himself back to the Abydos? Yes, yes, the 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 employee of Area 51 brought him there, yes. I, I had him escape, yeah. Okay, tell us that, because that's a, that's a great story. Oh, I don't know more about it. That That's all I know. I'm right there in the book. Uh, it was a book by Mac Malone, Beyond Area 51, where the mention of the alien J-Rod was one of two surviving greys captured in the crash in Kingman, Arizona in the 1950s. A man called Dan Burrish, microbiologist who worked for Naval Intelligence and the Defense Intelligence Agency, worked at Area 51, Groom Lake and S4 in Nevada. Uh, blah, blah. He asked there to take tissue samples during the period of two years, J-Rod revealed that his race had inhabited Earth many thousands of years before being forced to leave by several factors, a shift in the poles, extensive solar flares, extensive crumbling of the Earth's mantle. Um, you, you would learn later in your researches, uh, the armed forces of the Intergalactic Confederation uh, chased greys from outposts they held on Earth located under the Himalayas around 26,000 BC. The alien was tested, imprisoned in Area 51, and Burris, who cared for Jay Rod's mental and emotional well-being during his confinement, brought him to Abydos, Egypt. And Burash mentions that it had a, it, there was a, a natural stargate where he claims to have pushed his alien friend through the stargate from where he disappeared, never to be seen again. And from everything that you shared with us and your own knowledge, that sounds like it could be perfectly and absolutely truthful, doesn't it? Okay. Yes, yes, it's written yeah. in the book. <laughs> it absolutely is written in the book. Now, let's just do a quick rundown. When we talk about stargates, people are like, what's the difference between a stargate and a portal? Some people had never heard of jump rooms. What is the difference between a jump room and a stargate? So let's do a really quick, just synopsis um of those three in particular we won't we don't have to go into black holes and wormholes but just jump room stargate portal it's a uh, different technology a uh, jump room is a small teleportation device like a small it's not really a stargate it's a teleportation device can that can teleport uh humans and small small apparel so small devices or vehicles or whatever but really small things a stargate is a huge more huge uh structure that is also um can be artificial or natural uh this is different from the wormholes so i'm talking about uh man-made well artificially made uh, not especially by 
man. Uh, so it's, you have a teleportation device and you have Stargates. Stargates are also teleportation devices that work in a different way. They use a medium that is um, like we call dark energy. Um, it's a fluid. It's kind of a liquid fluid that is composed of vorticial particles. That means that the particles, instead of emitting energy, they suck it in. So they like micro black holes. The whole fluid is black hole material at a particle level. Okay. So when you activate the liquid by um, the substance by a frequency key, it's going to give a quantum point and then you activate a connection. And if you step in that liquid, you are going to be teleported to the destination point. It's a different technology. This can be used in space for fleets of spaceships, really big stuff. Now, stargates can occur at um, a natural, natural uh, state. You, you need to uh, take your head off the movie Stargate where it's flat. No, it's a bubble. A stargate is a bubble, a blob, a blob. A more or less spherical blob of this substance. That's what it is. Uh, check uh, JP's uh, updates about him going in the Atlantic arc and going through such a bubble. Tony Rodriguez in his book as well. Sirius Colony Cavalier describes such a transfer bubble, which is a little stargate anyways. So you can have that uh, teleportation device at the natural state in space, of course. Or not in space, on world somewhere. It's quite rare. It's quite rare. Uh, then you have warm holes. Warm holes are not teleportation uh, devices, natural or not. They are shortcuts through space time. So you you will uh, get out of the, the fabric of space time and travel out of it. In, in subliminal speed and arrive wherever the wormhole plugs into. You won't choose a destination. A wormhole is just a shortcut between two destinations and that's not moving. That's how it is. It's natural, you know. So wormholes, it's like if you have one and you can use it, it's useful, you go through it. But Stargate, it's better because you can really put the destination you want. Yeah. So exciting. Now, we are at the stage of this great work, this great brilliant history book, um, where it comes to the lost arcs, the space arcs. And um, I would um, suggest that we probably pick up next time we do a drop on the cedars because we've really delivered quite a lot of very deep, thoughtful information here. Um, I would like to suggest that we have another companion join us for the Lost Arcs part of our next broadcast together. We'll see if we can make that happen. Um, so let's leave it at, we'll start there, page 310, the next time we get together on this subject. Um, and in the meantime, um, what would you like to say to the audience? I would like to say to the audience that don't be fooled by distractions and by all the scare events that may happen on Earth at the moment. Uh, this is a dying deep state and the universe is showing you who are the liars, what are their agendas. Just be the observer to that. And in the meantime, be the actor of your own life and the future you want. Focus on your mission. What are you here for on earth? Find it. If you have a tool, we all have, we come with tools. What do you love to do? What are you good at? That's your tool. That's how you can change the world for a better future. So focus on that. Focus on finding who you are and connecting with your higher selves. You do not need anyone, anybody to activate you, help you find your memory. If you have difficulty to retrieve your past life memories, uh, I, I suggest Tony Rodriguez's recall course. You find it on his website, tonyrodriguez.com. He will not find your memory for you. He will 
guide you and show you the way how you can do it for yourself, by yourself. And anything that is done by yourself works truly and is genuine, you know. Uh, Thorhan always said to me, remembering is activating. No one can remember for you. You are the one who remembers. If you do it without hypnosis by yourself, well, you activate these memories. You activate your own power. So these are my end words, Denny. Very lovely. Very, very beautiful. And I just want to say to people, you know, it is very easy to be a warrior when you have a ton of unhealed pain, anger, and rage inside of you from your childhood. And some of us come into this world, into this experience of this life in these avatars, in these vessels with unhealed wounds from then. So there's a double pain, if you will. And I'm watching these young boys um, young men in their 20s, you know, warring in civil war, and they're so amped up. And they are, you know, some of the most scary age group. That's why they've been imported all over the world to get them amped up, to get them to try and, you know, do whatever they, they were planning to do. But it's not happening. So, guys, don't go into panic. And it's not about black boy on white boy or brown boy on yellow boy. No, they're trying to make it that. We got to be bigger than that. We got to remember that we are all brothers and sisters and some people believe in a different God and that's all right, they can. Of course, there are rules around that and not forcing other people to, because there's nothing about love there, is there? If it's all forceful and violence, that is a thousand million percent Enlil. That's Enlil's bollocks. You know, if we're going to take it to a scenario of love and, and hate, you know, Enlil and Ia, um, Ia being the, the loving, the one that's been trying to... Um, you know, support and remind and help people wake up to themselves. But yeah, so it's going to be difficult. People are terrified. The The rage in the, the fathers whose little girls were stabbed to death yesterday. Um, you can't even imagine the agony they're going through. And um, but we need to try not to get triggered into civil war because it is the actual uh, beginning with no end of a dystopia that the predator class, as you cleverly named it, are looking for. They want us to kill, maim and murder each other. They want us to rely on them completely. And if we continue with that unhealed pain and rage in us, then that potentially is what we could be looking at. But I know, and Elena knows, that that's not the future in front of us. It just looks that way right now. Now to be with your star family, to be with people like you, come and join us at the Galactic Spiritual Informers Conference, 27th, 28th, 29th of, of September this year. The tickets are going up on August 1st, which is tomorrow. Um, so when you watch this, this is coming out on August the 1st, you've got till midnight tonight um, to get your ticket um, and join us there for the three days to see the great rocket man, David Adair. Alex Colley will be hanging out for three days in the audience with us, with you. He's going to be doing a couple of announcements on stage as well. We've got the great Dr. K uh, Christiane Northrup, the great Dr. Uh, Lee Merritt, the naval whistleblower, um, medical surgeon whistleblower. We have Dan Willis with his frill energy generator that everyone's going to get to feel the energy of the frill this year. I'm so excited about that. Dr. Michael Sala will be there. JP, the Special Forces Unit, Army Insider, will be coming out on stage for the very first time. We have Melanie Charré from the, her secret space programs, Child Torture Programs, who now does Child Rescue. Tony Rodriguez, one of the most fascinating people on our entire planet, who Elena has mentioned several times, as did I, um, you know, for the Satanics, the Galactics and the military. This man has experienced all three uh, of those gateways and has come back and lived to tell the tale. Um, we have the great Jean-Charles Moyen, the great movie director that's made the films on his own incredible life and work. It's unbelievable what Jean-Charles has experienced. And um, <clears throat> I think that's everybody. There's 13 of us this year. 12, 13 of us, if I've forgotten someone, then forgive me. Um, but they are all absolutely first-class rock stars, incredible. And of course, we have the one and only Elena Danan, the emissary for the Galactic Federation of Worlds. It's very, very, very exciting. And there's going to be absolutely more craft in the sky that you can shake a stick at. We can actually guarantee 
there will be actual UFO alien off planet craft, not what the military make, not their have a go UFOs, but the real ones from the Galactic Federation of Worlds. We're actually guaranteeing that, aren't we, Elena? Yes, we are guaranteed. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, Thorhan agreed to uh, perform this uh, show <laughs> for uh, for me, for us in, in France, in the uh, conference in France that was occurring in July. And so I know what is going to be. Uh, we're going to have the same show and even more uh, because uh, Thorhan, you know, being at the high command uh, of his battleship, he has... Uh, um, decision on the fleet so he can organize uh, a show and uh, well you know that's that's you are going to be impressed because it's um, for someone who has never seen that it's very impressive we had um, I know in France we had 700 people at the time there were two sessions they were like shouting and jumping and crying it was incredible and that's going to happen for Jessic and even more he said to me so I don't know what he's going to do more than this <laughs> oh but uh, that is I know uh, for having witnessed people seeing that kind of stuff, it, it's 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 going to be very emotional, you know, uh, for for all of you who have never seen a spaceship. So um, I warn you, it's going to be emotional <laughs> and oh unforgettable for for all these people. So uh, uh, yes, that that's going to be a great show. Oh my goodness, I know what's coming. I know, I know what's going to be. I'm honestly just the proudest I could ever possibly imagine myself to be that I can actually say that, that at our conference, we're going to see a beautiful display, a ballet, a symphony of craft flown by beautiful military personnel, you know, off yeah. personnel of all different races from Sirius B to the Pleiades, I mean, from all over. And they're going to be there harmonizing hearts and feelings with us, showing us what they've got, showing off in their craft. And there's absolutely nothing nothing to behold at that moment more beautiful than that it's going to be and to, to be able to guarantee it for people too and the technology that we're sharing the ets in the actual audience the ets that will be standing on stage i mean it is the most amazing in, in all my life i never imagined that i would be you know involved in something so magnificent at this time on our planet so guys get yourselves a ticket it's only 655 right now. My God, 655 for three full days of all of that with the greatest speakers in the world. Okay, enough said. Elena Danan, I love you, my best mate in the whole of the planets and the systems and the universes. And I'm so glad we're back on Earth and we're sharing everything we know to be true with the people that we love dearly, that we love dearly. So guys, I am Danny Henderson. I do send you love from my heart to yours and I will see you soon.